Hey guys, I've just picked up a brand new Ineos Grenadier in a magic mushroom colour. Check this out. Here we are in a brand new Ineos Grenadier. Nothing like picking up a brand new car you're not used to and your peak hour traffic. Hang on a minute. Now I've got to juggle four cars. With most car reviews or four-wheel drive reviews, I only have it for a day. I take it for a spin, I put it through all its paces, usually more than what most people would do anyway, and then I let the audience decide. Because I can't make a decision on how good a car is just from one day. But in this case, with this Grenadier, I've got it for a mid to long-term loan, which means I have a six-month window to use and test this Grenadier for anything I choose to do, meaning, I have full access to this car, including the freedom to add accessories and modify the vehicle. And that's why I'm so excited about this vehicle and this whole project. So what brought this opportunity about? Well, you guys actually. The most requested vehicle for me to attain was the Ineos Grenadier. And along the way, I would love for you guys to be part of this journey. So get commenting below for test suggestions, any concerns you have about this vehicle, and any questions or anything else. One of my main conditions for reviewing a vehicle is that I don't get restricted to what I can and can't say. That is the main thing. Otherwise, I'm not interested. This is not a paid promotion. This is an opportunity to try this vehicle out. Although I do play fair, I always point out the good that I think it's bloody awesome. And the bad is the long drive that concerns me. When it comes to vehicle reviews, and that's the difference you'll get when you compare it to what other people do. This isn't the first time I've had any experience with an Ineos Grenadier. Almost two years ago, I got to experience the prototype. However, I decided not to talk about it because I was a passenger, not a driver. I then spotted one last year with a roof conversion at the Sydney Four Wheel Drive Show. I got talking to the owner and a group of us went out four wheel driving and camping. Although I did get to drive it for about three hours and explore the car, I still felt I didn't have enough to really like experience to talk about it. We did a whole shoot, we did a whole feature. To go from that and not even releasing that video to this is pretty f***ing exciting. Normal cars have a driver's seat. This I refer to as a cockpit. There is so much to comprehend. It's a total different driving experience. It, this particular vehicle really needs to be driven and tested and taken on a trip, lived out of, put through situations, and of course, modifying it. Because anyone who buys a vehicle like this will want to modify it. We all do. We're 535 kilometers in exactly so far, and I feel like I'm at a stage where I can give you my first impressions, but also I know more about the vehicle. I can now actually talk about what's on the vehicle rather than someone who's just picked up the vehicle for two hours and has no idea about it and then tries to tell you something that they've read off a brochure. This is a 2024 Ineos Grenadier. It's the base model, although it has a few extra things on it. Now, I'm not a techie guy. I like simplicity. The tech that's in the vehicle that I've seen so far is all off-road tech. So it is cool tech, but is it all necessary? And that's what we're gonna find out. And there are some concerns I have with this vehicle and they're mainly to do with traveling before my concerns, however. One of the coolest facts about this vehicle is designed for off-roading. It has a steel bar on the front and you can actually remove this fascia here and then install hoops to it, which won't actually increase too much weight on the vehicle because the steel bar's already there. On top of that, we've got bash plate front, bash plate rear, skid plates underneath. And I've never seen a vehicle manufacturer offer a decent rock slider. That, so that's a proper rock slider. I'll take my hat off to that. They're actually offering a rock slider, not usually with the base model. That's an addition. What's also an addition is the winch inside the front bar as well. So it's not something that comes with the base model. A car that comes with off-road tires, but 18 inch alloys. Don't really agree with that. However, having decent tires can actually make up for that. They do offer a 17 inch rim and these are all terrains. I'm likely, no, not likely. I will change them to mud terrains after this first test run. Straight away, 17 inch wheels and mud tires. What is also not standard on the base model is a snorkel. Hang on, it's not a snorkel, it's a raised air intake. 
the waiting depth is still 800 mils, which is just above the tires. This doesn't mean you can go in through water up to here. It's a bit like the Toyota style raised air intake. It's in multiple pieces and it won't be water sealed. The waiting depth is limited to around the top of the tires. This vehicle from the front it definitely has European vibes. It gives you that Mercedes kind of feel when you look at it. What do you reckon? Something else I forgot about. Rated recovery points, both sides and both ends of the vehicle, front and back. Down the side, I've used L-Track, so you can mount these little hooks in there. I don't really know what I would put there. I do know someone's done a bit of a fuel pod that hangs off this handle and then clips into here, which may be a necessity, and I'll tell you why in a little bit. That's one of my concerns. Up here, this is one of my favorite parts about this vehicle, and I wish every full drive manufacturer would at least explore the idea of doing this. This is a power outlet. There are four of these on the roof. The overhead console is full of switches, pre-switched, pre-wired, pre-fused. All you gotta do is put whatever it is you want to put on here on the other end of it, plug it in, and there you go, you've got power on a Deutsch plug. That, I think, is bloody awesome. Massive gutter as well, so you can mount a roof rack to it. This vehicle has a static load of 425 kilos and a dynamic load, meaning while you're driving, you can have 150 kilos on top of the roof. Not too many vehicles have that. That was a lot of positivity, and it's all good stuff, but there are some negative points too. And if you know me well enough, I always bring those up. One of them, my main concern about this vehicle, is the fuel range. It only has a 90 litre tank. I'm used to driving around with minimum 130 litres, and usually I'll have somewhere between 200 to 300 litres. When do you need that much fuel, you might say? If you're in Australia, WA, South Australia, Northern Territory in particular, and you want to go on the tracks less travelled, the roads less travelled, the deserts, you need a magic range of minimum 1,000 k's. There is no fuel out there. There's nowhere to stop. And even if there is a fuel stop out there, they may not have fuel. It's quite bizarre, isn't it? All the way out here in the middle of nowhere, and there's a roadhouse. You have to call ahead and find out, obviously, so there are things you can do to make it work, but it's something you need to be aware of. Having fuel anxiety is not fun when you're traveling through the desert. I would say this vehicle needs to be able to carry another 40 liters minimum. To do that, that's two jerry cans. That means we need to add a roof rack or something, or the fuel pot I was talking about, or something on the door on the back that it can hold fuel. That'll bring it up to 130 liters, that is the only thing that I'm concerned about in a travel sense. Oh, hang on, there's one more thing actually. While I show you my second concern with the vehicle, we're also going to look at the interior, which to me sings out European luxury. It is freaking nice in here. I'm sitting in a Recaro seat, and these seats feel pretty damn good. I'm not a big fan of leather, but the shape of the seats is really nice. All right, let's get to the negative first. As soon as you get in, if you're a tall person in particular, you'll notice that your left foot only has one place to go. This leg is down lower than the other leg. In an off-road aspect and short drives, you forget about it pretty quick. It's not an issue. But what I'm worried about is on a very long drive, I like to knock out a thousand k's a day if I'm traveling from one end of the country to the other end. And I do that every single year, a couple of times. Am I going to feel like I'm sitting in an airplane for too long, just with the left leg? To be honest, you do forget about it, but it's the long drive. It's the long drive that concerns me. All right, I've banged on about that enough. Let's get on to the rest of the interior. First impressions from a steering point of view, it's quite responsive. I do feel the steering wheel, it does feel a bit small. Buttons on the edge, you've got to watch where your hand position is. So you really do have to do the, the 10 and 2 position up here because if you're down here, you can easily mash the buttons and I've had Siri pop up a couple of times. Find any matching places. Oh crap. They have integrated an armrest into the door. Look how thick that is. It's actually in the best spot. As I mentioned earlier, it's very overwhelming getting into the vehicle, but once you've been in here for a little while, you kind of get used to it. So let's turn it on. 
what you will notice, there's not much in front of you to get your speed and know what gear you're sitting in and know the RPM you're doing or your fuel, you've got to look over here, it's not there. Having all the center cluster here could also have been inspired by the Land Rover series two or three or whichever one. I think it's more to do with getting all the distraction out of the way. The very overwhelming section. Once you're in the car and you've driven it and you've worked out that all you need to know is this and this. You don't need to worry about any of that unless you're going off-road or you're camping. That is where you focus. Aircon, top row. Next row down is demisters and recirculation and turn the auto start off. Every time you get in the car, just turn it off straight away unless you, you like auto start and you want to go through starter motors. Down here we have the gear shifter. This is the full drive shifter. You can go low range without locking the center. Meaning, you want to reverse the caravan, reverse the trailer, you can go into low range and you got nice controlled speed. Moving on from that down here, this you can control the infotainment system with as well. So you got moving it up here. Probably a lot safer doing that if you need to keep an eye on the road. This one in particular has the top hatch. Uh, let's shut that. While you're sitting in this vehicle, it gives you the aircraft vibes as well as like a fancy European car. So I kind of feel like it needs some kind of classical music going over a few little cuts of this car because it is beautiful. But there's a couple of little things. I want to address. All right, so I had my AirPods down here the other day. I had my Sunnies up here. My phone I had to put in a passenger seat, but if I had a passenger, I might have gone up here. The thing is, it's very slippery. It's inviting you to put stuff here because it's got this indent, like it's like, I'm a table. Put stuff here, put it here. And there's this bit down here. Taking a corner, AirPods went down there. Taking off at a set of lights. All this went down here. This needs a non-slip mat coming soon. This needs a non-slip mat. And the second cup holder is likely going to be holding my phone. Speaking of cup holders, two in a center console, but they only fit small bottles. In saying that, there is one in each door that fits the bigger bottles. What's the seating space like? We know about the driver's seat. What, what about, about the, the passenger, passenger seat? Good. Ample room in the passenger seat. I can move the chair way, way back as well. Heaps of room very very comfortable in the rear with the driver's seat more or less in a good position for me to drive still have room in the back my knees are still not touching the seat in fact behind the seat it's got this concave sort of shape and on this side with the seat in a normal position i have about 150 mil until my knee touches that seat heaps of room heaps of headroom as well the back seats i've just realized are Recaro seats. <laughs> a Recaro back bench seat. It's insane. The middle seat is a little bit questionable, but they are in most cars. The center console is quite wide. If you're sitting in the back, you'll be doing some man spreading, fighting over some foot room with your passengers right next to you. And the battery is not under the bonnet. It's in here, under the back seat. Fuses, battery charger there are two batteries in this vehicle one's a house battery one is a starter battery the only thing is they're both lead acid they're both linked together which means that if you are going to run a fridge off it and you leave the battery switch on that's up on the roof console you can drain your batteries flat on the positive side of things everything is already set up For having power and everything i mean it's it's pretty well kitted this car but there are some things that would need to change for Australian conditions. And that's the way the batteries are linked and charged. First impressions from power and the drive, pretty good. You do have to put your foot down a little bit more than what I'm used to, but no issues. It's, it's there. It's gonna push a bit further on the pedal than what I'm used to. It's sitting in seventh gear right now and climbing a hill doing about 88. Parent is really comfortable vehicle with this beautiful armrest right here. It's a BMW 3 litre diesel engine, it's a straight six. Kilowatts are 183, let's just say 180. 
I don't really care about that number. What I care about is the torque. 550 newton meters of torque and the torque range starts from about 1250 up to 3000 RPM. And when you consider the fact it's got eight gears, that is pretty good. Attached to the engine is a ZF eight speed automatic gearbox. It's a very well known gearbox and is used in a lot of different vehicles. For a heavy car, it does move. Coming up to the end of Nike zone, see how fast we can get up to 110. Scary to know how fast this thing could actually go. There's a lot of different material in this vehicle. There's plastic, there's aluminium, and there's steel. Now the doors I suspect are aluminium. This center part and the whole frame of the car is all steel. The bonnet is plastic. Imagine if the whole car was steel. I reckon it would be close to three ton. But it doesn't feel heavy when you drive it though. This vehicle rolls out of the showroom floor at nearly 2.7 tonne. But the GVM does save it a little bit. So three and a half tonne plus the extra 55 kilos. So three, five, five, five. That's a decent sized GVM. Payload wise, 800 kilos you can slap onto this vehicle. And for a vehicle this size and the weight, you don't feel it when you're driving it. I mean, you do feel like you're in a, an armored vehicle, but it handles quite nice. It handles the corners real good. The GCM, the gross combined mass, this vehicle and whatever trailer you put on the back can be up to seven ton. Now that is a pretty high number. The tow ball weight is 350 kilos. This vehicle being specifically designed for off-roading, where do you see it performing at its peak? What type of terrain? And what type of situation do you see this falling short? And will it be easy to modify? That is another big question that still remains. Will I like it as much as this vehicle? And will the Ineos Grenadier be able to do a trip like that? I guess there's only one way to find out. And if you haven't seen those videos, you better get onto it. On that note, it's time to hit the road. And that's about the cheesiest thing I've done today.